to this lecture session on cartilage. If I asked you to take a moment to describe what cartilage is and what it looks like, you'd probably struggle with the question a little. This is to be expected. There's actually a lot of diversity in cartilage tissue, depending on the type and the location. There's hyaline cartilage, lining the bones of synovial joints, the meniscal pads within the knee joints, and fibrocartilage that makes up the intervertebral discs. But all of these have importance in different orthopedic conditions. One of the things that all forms of cartilage has is fundamentally weak healing abilities, which, of course, has major implications with orthopedic surgery. Now, before we can get into any of these specific details about the pathology of cartilage damage, we need to cover the basics, which is the purpose of the present session. In this session, we'll look at the fundamental components that define cartilage tissue and look at the specific characteristics of hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. We're also going to look at cartilage development and growth, which will also help with our understanding of bone growth in a later segment. On the surface, cartilage bears some similarities to the tendons and ligaments we just discussed. Cartilage is made up of secretory cells floating in a matrix of protein and ground substances that the cells themselves secrete. As we'll see, it's the composition of the extracellular matrix that defines cartilage and is responsible for its inherent properties. There's some variability in the specific concentrations of each of these substances, which allows us to distinguish between three different subclasses of cartilage, which we'll be looking at in a later section. Cartilage plays important roles in providing shock absorption to mechanical loads on the body and providing a smooth surface for joint gliding. As we'll see in the next session, cartilage is also important for providing the initial framework for bone formation and continues to play a role in bone growth through adolescence. At its foundation, cartilage is made up of a distinct group of differentiated mesenchymal stem cells called the chondrocytes, embedded in a matrix of protein and ground substance that they secrete. The appearance of the cells varies depending on their location within the matrix. Centrally located chondrocytes are referred to as medullary chondrocytes. They have a more rounded appearance and are generally found in groups of about eight, which resembles a small cluster of grapes. The cells located towards the surface of the cartilage model have a more elliptical appearance and are separated from one another by secreted matrix. The semi-solid nature of the cartilage matrix limits the mobility of cells, and as a result, each occupies a distinct space referred to as a lacuna which is a Latin term meaning little lake. The image to the right shows a micrograph of cartilage. Looking at the image gives the impression that chondrocytes have a dark staining nucleus in clear cytoplasm, similar to what is seen with adipocytes. This is actually an artifact of the histological preparation. During the tissue dehydration phase, the chondrocytes shrink dramatically while the semi-solid matrix maintains the dimensions of the lacuna. The dark staining portion is what remains of the cell after tissue processing, and the lightly stained periphery is empty space in the lacuna that the cell once inhabited. The cartilage matrix is distinct from the densely packed protein matrix of tendon and ligament. Collagen is still abundant, but less dense, with fibers running obliquely rather than parallel to provide stability and tensile strength in multiple directions. Interspersed with this loosely packed collagen are numerous strands of heavily glycosylated proteoglycans. A common motif involves long strands of glycosaminoglycans such as chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate radiating out from a protein core. The arrangement bears some resemblance to a test tube brush, with the bristles representing the proteoglycans radiating out from the wire handle, which represents the protein core. In turn, these proteoglycan units are anchored at their base to hyaluronic acid, which is an additional long-chain glycosaminoglycan, through linker glycoproteins such as chondronectin. This is what gives cartilage its physical properties. Electrostatic interactions between collagen and the proteoglycans provide a good balance between strength and flexibility, and the hygroscopic nature of the sugar moieties draws water into the matrix like a sponge. This is what gives cartilage its gel-like properties. A great deal of attention has been paid over the past few decades to glucosamine sulfate supplementation, typically in combination with chondroitin, for improving joint health, 
in particular for those suffering from arthritis. Glucosamine is an amino sugar which serves as a precursor in the polymerization of glycosaminoglycans, and chondroitin is one of the glycosaminoglycan polymers, the bristle of the proteoglycan brush. A great deal of research has been conducted on the efficacy of these supplements, and the general consensus is that these supplements, in particular chondroitin, do demonstrate improvement in pain management and mobility when compared to placebo. What is less certain is if these improvements are substantial enough to have a meaningful impact on the quality of life for those suffering from osteoarthritis, or if supplementation can stave off or slow the progression of the disease. The outer surface of cartilage is composed of a thin layer of dense irregular connective tissue known as the perichondrium. This outer shell contains fibroblasts rather than chondrocytes, which primarily secrete type 1 collagen to further reinforce and protect the cartilage matrix, as well as provide a conduit for the neurovascular supply to the cartilage. The transition to this dense irregular connective tissue matrix is not abrupt. Rather, there is a gradual transition where the number of chondrocytes decrease and the number of fibroblasts increase. It is important to note that not all types of cartilage contain this outer layer of perichondrium, as we'll see when we look at the cartilage covering joint surfaces. A moment ago, we mentioned the blood supply embedded in the perichondrium. We don't, however, see any blood vessels within the cartilaginous matrix itself. This is because of the negative effects that a rich vascular supply would have on cartilage. Calcium ions within the blood could crystallize within the cartilage matrix, resulting in matrix calcification. A similar effect is seen with trauma and bleeding in muscle tissue, which results in calcification, a condition known as myositis ossificans. To prevent this from happening, chondrocytes secrete anti-angiogenic factors such as chondromodulin 1 to inhibit local angiogenesis from occurring. The matrix is also void of a nerve supply, which is why cartilage damage is generally not painful in and of itself. This creates a problem with nutrient supply to the cartilage. Remember, cartilage contains living cells that require nutrient delivery and waste removal. These cells are dependent on the diffusion of nutrients from the blood supply along the perichondrium. The circulation of nutrients in thicker cartilage is facilitated through periodic compressive forces on the cartilage matrix. Because of its semi-solid matrix, cartilage acts like a sponge, where compression squeezes fluid out of the matrix with fluid being drawn back in when the compressive force is removed. This facilitates removal of waste material from the matrix and movement of nutrients to deep within the matrix more rapidly than would occur with passive diffusion alone. It also suggests that weight-bearing activity may promote healthy cartilage in load-bearing areas of the body. Although effective, this method of nutrient circulation is much less efficient than for cells with a rich vascular supply, which limits the ideal thickness of cartilage and minimizes the metabolic activity of chondrocytes. This low metabolic activity hinders the chondrocytes' ability to assist in the repair of worn out or damaged cartilage, which is why age-related degeneration of cartilage occurs at a faster rate than for more vascular tissue and why damaged cartilage does not tend to heal well following injury. This is particularly the case for thicker cartilage, such as meniscus, where nutrient supply and metabolic activity are particularly low. Cartilage forms from embryonic mesenchyme through the process of chondrogenesis. Mesenchyme is undifferentiated connective tissue containing mesenchymal stem cells. Stem cells can be thought of as students moving through different levels of schooling. At the top of the list are the pluripotent stem cells that have not gone through any differentiation and can become literally any tissue. These are like elementary school children that have the potential to become anything after they grow up. This is also where most of the research is due to the wide application for these cells in medicine. Mesenchymal stem cells have differentiated slightly to become some form of connective tissue cell, though the exact type has not been determined. This would be like a university grad. An engineering major will be able to specialize in multiple jobs related to mechanical or electrical engineering, but will not have the training to enter social work. In tissue designated to become cartilage, the mesenchymal stem cells condense and differentiate into chondroprogenitor cells and eventually into chondroblasts. You can think of these as being part of the workforce. 
They have graduated from university, selected a specialization, and are now actively doing what they have been designed to do. In this case, produce cartilage matrix. They have a rounded appearance and the cytoplasm contains a high volume of ribosomes as a result of the high levels of protein synthesis. This is the phase of the cell's life cycle in which it is most metabolically active and requires the greatest amount of energy. In the next phase of the life cycle, when the cartilage model is fully formed, the cells further differentiate into chondrocytes. These represent the retirees. They are no longer as metabolically active as the working chondroblasts. Instead, they play a role in maintaining the local extracellular environment, replacing matrix damage through normal wear and tear. This process of differentiation from chondroblasts to chondrocytes begins centrally, then radiates out to the peripheral portions of the cartilage. This progression is logical as the cartilage expands out from the central region, as we'll see in a second, and the deepest regions would be the most deficient in nutrients, making it difficult for osteoblastic activity to continue. Cartilage growth occurs by two separate processes taking place at the same time. One is interstitial growth, which takes place deep within the medullary region of the model. The second is appositional growth, taking place along the periphery of the model. With interstitial growth, chondroblasts deep within the matrix will divide, secreting matrix in all directions as they do. The matrix secreted within the space between cells helps to push them away from one another, and the secretion of matrix in all directions allows the cartilage model to expand in a radiating pattern. The pattern is similar to the inflation of a balloon as it expands with air. As the volume of air inside the balloon increases, it pushes equally in all directions, and the balloon expands in all directions. This is most commonly seen in developing cartilage, and as we'll see in the upcoming lesson, with the epithelial plates of growing long bones. Once the cartilage model approaches maturity, the sheer volume of deposit of cartilage makes it difficult for expansion to continue from the deepest regions of the model, and interstitial growth slows and ceases. This is the point at which chondroblasts differentiate into less active chondrocytes. Think back to the expanding balloon analogy. As the balloon fills with air, the rubber making up the outer surface of the balloon becomes stretched, making the rubber taut. If the balloon is overinflated, the rubber tears and the balloon pops. Consequently, there is a maximum volume for which a given balloon can expand, based on the surface area of the rubber. Cartilage faces the same limitation, and perichondrium is not nearly as stretchy as rubber. To allow cartilage expansion to occur, growth along the outer surface is focused on expanding surface area. This is referred to as appositional growth. Here, the cellular division and matrix secretion is focused in a two-dimensional plane parallel to the surface of the model, rather than the three dimensions that we see with interstitial growth. As with the deeper portions, some of these chondroblasts will differentiate into chondrocytes as they become enveloped in matrix. As growth nears completion, chondroblasts along the interface with the perichondrium will lay dormant. Time to discuss the three distinct types of cartilage that is found within the body. The most abundant is hyaline cartilage, which is found in the cartilage of the nose and ribs and lining the surface of synovial joints. The major protein component within the matrix is type 2 collagen. While the hyaline cartilage model that makes up the ribs and nose contains an outer perichondrium, that lining the synovial joints does not. We'll describe the composition of the outer surface in a later session, where we will look specifically at joints. Under the light microscope, the cells are typically packed close together, separated by thin extracellular matrix. It's a little difficult to appreciate in this image on the right due to the pale appearance of the lacuna following shrinkage of the cell cytoplasm. Elastic cartilage has a similar structure to hyaline cartilage, but is distinguished by a particularly high concentration of elastic connective tissue. This is found in regions of the body that require certain degrees of both rigidity and flexibility. Examples include the cartilage making up the external ears and epiglottis. To the naked eye, elastic cartilage typically has a yellowish hue due to the presence of elastin fibers. 
Under the light microscope, elastic cartilage is difficult to distinguish from hyaline cartilage with normal H&E staining. A Verhoff stain, as shown here on the right, helps with this distinction, with elastin fibers staining black. Fibrocartilage can be thought of as a hybrid tissue, containing properties of both hyaline cartilage and dense regular connective tissue. This is found in the intervertebral discs and symphysis pubis, where its tensile strength resists tearing. Fibrocartilage lacks a distinct perichondrium, as the entire matrix contains elements of dense connective tissue. The matrix is made up primarily of type 1 collagen, which can be arranged in either regular or irregular patterns, depending on the forces acting upon the tissue. Under the light microscope, fibrocartilage can be distinguished by the organized rows of chondrocytes lined up end to end, in parallel with the prevailing line of force. A view through the electron microscope reveals distinct differences in the chondroblasts from fibrocartilage as compared to other cartilage types. Both contain dense networks of rough endoplasmic reticulum, which reflects the high levels of protein production. A key difference is in the much more developed Golgi apparatus associated with the chondroblasts in hyaline cartilage. This is the result of the higher levels of proteoglycan production in the chondroblasts from hyaline cartilage, which require greater levels of post-translational modification. That completes our discussion of cartilage tissue. In the next session, we look at another connective tissue type, which started out as cartilage before it morphed into something else. This is bone tissue.